Um, so now this video is going to be specifically about TPA and then a care um, or really like medical treatment for someone who's having an acute ischemic stroke. So think of what are we going to do for a patient that has a clot in their brain? Um, so um, TPA is a medication that bothers me because TPA is the, the right letters are not capitalized or not capital or the ones that are supposed to not be capitalized are capitalized, but just go with me with this one. And I'm going to try to let go of my perfectionism maybe by next year. Um, so TPA is a medication also known as tissue. Uh, I, man, I should have looked it up before <laughs> tissue. Cause I always say it wrong tissue plasminogen antigen. Now I feel like that's when I always say and it's wrong. It's like tissue plasma something tissue plasma yeah maybe it is tissue plasminogen antigen it doesn't really matter we always call it tpa um but you know if you need to know it's something like tissue plasminogen antigen or anti anti something so yes you get the point um you guys can google we call it tpa i don't sit around telling the doctor please get the tissue plasminogen antigen stat um like you know no um we just say tpa um, so anyway, um, this is a medication that's used for acute ischemic stroke. It is a clot buster. So, you know, in previous sections like cardiac, we talked about antiplatelets, we talked about anticoagulants, and then we have yet to talk about this. This is a clot buster. So this is the strongest of all the meds we've talked about. We have antiplatelets that can prevent anticoagulants that can stop you from forming new clots. Then this is the only one, TPA is the only one we've talked about that is actually a treatment that can acutely treat a clot. This can acutely bust a clot or it breaks down a clot. So if I have a clot in my brain causing a stroke, it can go in and get that thing, that sucker, um, uh, like, um, I was going to say, uh, broken down and then um, allow for return of flow. So this is for ischemic strokes only. Um, we cannot use this in a hemorrhagic stroke. And um, there's, as a, I've kind of alluded to in some of the other videos, there's certain parameters around when we can use TPA um, and when um, it's not appropriate. So there's like research has just shown that it's a helpful med, but only if given within a short window of time for when the symptoms started up the stroke. Real quick, in case you're wondering what this picture is, um, remember how I've been like harping on about like you have to get a CT to rule out that they're not bleeding. Um, so if I got a CT of the head for a patient to see if they were having ischemic versus hemorrhagic, this is what a hemorrhagic stroke looks like. Um, they're usually going to have this very big um, like white space in their brain, which is a sign of bleeding. Um, so all of this is blood. Um, so if I had a patient that I was trying to see, like, let's see if we can get them TPA because they're having stroke symptoms. If I did this, this would tell me eh, they're having a, um, a hemorrhagic stroke. They cannot get the TPA. But I just want to show you in case that helps. Anyway, so some of the rules around TPA is it has to be given within four and a half hours of the onset of symptoms. Um, your book says three to four and a half hours. So that might be like some hospitals vary, but you just need to know about the four and a half. And when it says three to four and a half, it doesn't mean that we have to wait till it's been three hours. If someone came in and said, hey, 30 minutes ago, um, my speech got slurred and blah, like someone, they'd probably come in with someone. But let's say someone said like, hey, their speech, you know, got slurred 30 minutes ago. We're not going to be like, oh, well, we have to wait till three hours in to start using this med. No, like what it's just saying is it might vary, but you really want to look at that end and stop time. So after about four and a half hours, like the risk of giving TPA um, is bigger than the benefit that they can receive from it. Um, up until that point, if we, it, like that's why that question, when did your symptoms start? When was your last known normal is so important um, because um, when it comes down to it, uh, I need to know if they're in that window where it's safe to give, because pretty much this window is what they found is, is that that even though TPA is a very risky drug because they can bleed to death, like the biggest side effect is bleeding, um, big concern for bleeding because these patients like they pretty much lose the ability to clot at all. So if they start bleeding, they are not going to stop. And so um, for like 24 hours. And so um, the it's a very risky drug to give. Um, but for someone that's having an acute stroke, sometimes it's their best hope. So in that four and a half hour window, if we, if they've had, if they started to have their stroke and within those four and a half hours, research has shown that giving it is a benefit that outweighs the risk of them bleeding to death. Um, but once we get outside of that window, the risk versus the benefit changes. Um, so other things that we need to look at is we need to look um, again, at, uh, I talked to you about blood pressure. So blood pressure is something that we check early on. Um, and we check it early on because there's certain, 
um, there's certain parameters that they have to meet in order to uh, be safe to get TPA. And one of them is blood pressure. So in order to get TPA, a client's blood pressure needs to be below systolic of 185 and below a systolic of 110. So this is not a contraindication. Like I said, everyone, not everyone, most stroke patients are going to come in with a high blood pressure, but if they come in with a high blood pressure, I can give them medications. Usually we give them like IV um, calcium channel blockers or IV beta blockers and um, to decrease their blood pressure. And um, we do that um, to get them to the point where we can give the TPA. So it's not, and don't think of it just like, like Hey, I'm going to get their blood pressure below this and then give the TPA and then whatever I have to keep their blood pressure stable. Because if I'm giving a medication, that's going to cause them to be really high um, chance of bleeding. I do not want their blood pressure high. Cause what could happen? They can end up burst in something, um, and, um, bleeding profusely, and then they wouldn't be able to stop and they could die. So we want to keep their blood pressure manageable, but like I brought up in my last video, it's a very fine balance. Like we want their blood pressure high enough. We usually like to keep it 140 to 160, but we don't want it super high and everyone's a little different. Again, that's not something you'll be tested over, but just know we do like to keep it a little bit on the higher side. Um, so what's my role as the nurse? So if I'm giving TPA for, to a patient, um, I want to do frequent vital signs and, uh, you know, neurological checks or check their mental status. I'm going to be looking for bleeding and seeing if they, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, you know, of course, cause this is the biggest side effect of this medication. I want to be looking if they're bleeding from anywhere. Now they're going to ooze from places. They're going to have like a little bit of oozing around their IV sites and things like that. Um, but they, they should not have, um, any um, profuse bleeding or anything from anywhere. Um, and then the biggest thing like that I kind of, I brought up when I was talking, there was the scenario. If you watch the scenario over the, if you watch, if you watch my NIH stroke scale video, I did a scenario where I talked about a person who received TPA and their NIH increased. And if you remember, NIH is something that is a measure of how many deficits a patient has after a stroke. And we want that number going down, not up. So if I, if the patient already had so many deficits, then I'm giving them a treatment that's supposed to make them better, but their mental status is getting worse. That's usually a sign that this patient originally had an ischemic stroke. They had a clot. And then I gave them this medicine. It maybe started to help treat them, but if they start to get worse, then a lot of times it's a sign that they then maybe burst a blood vessel and now they're bleeding. So now they have a hemorrhagic stroke. It's what we call hemorrhagic conversion. So in other words, someone can start with an ischemic stroke, but then we give them a medicine to treat that. <clears throat> that medicine has a very big side effect of bleeding. Um, and if they, um, if their blood vessels in the brain are already very high risk or, um, you know, end up with a bleed, then we end up having a ischemic stroke that became a hemorrhagic stroke. It's what we call hemorrhagic conversion. Um, so effectively with this patient, if they're going to receive TPA, I, there's all the stuff I talked about in the last video where we have to do all those checks to make sure it actually is an ischemic stroke. To the best of my knowledge, we want to make sure it's not a hemorrhagic stroke. We want to make sure that they're in that window of time to receive the TPA. And we want to make sure their blood pressure is stable. And then after receiving it, and this is something that's given pretty quickly. It's usually given somewhere like in between like 20 or 30 minutes, I believe. Um, it's usually given the ER. I've, I've maybe given it once up in the ICU, but usually given the ER. Um, and so um, we're watching their vital signs and neuro checks frequently. When I say frequently, it's like every 15 minutes, every 15 minutes um, for, um, you know, so many hours, then it's every 30 for so many hours, then it's every um, hour for like 20 something hours. So like it's, it's, it's very frequent. Um, and we're going to watch closely for bleeding and changes in mental status. Their mental status should be getting better, not worse. And if it is getting worse, we'll probably have to give them um, stop that med. All right, so let's do some practice with this because it'll help to bring it together because I've given you a lot of information. Um, one other thing we haven't talked about, the reason I have this question too, is that there are other contraindications to receiving TPA. Um, so um, this will this activity, and then I have a slide about it, will hopefully help you to better understand why would someone receive TPA or not be able to receive TPA. Um, so, uh, so which of these clients can receive TPA? A client with a blood pressure of 210 over 115. So if you remember from the last slide, their blood pressure cannot be above 185 over 110, I think. Um, so you might say no to this patient. So this client cannot at this time receive TPA, but can we get their blood pressure down and then give it? 
Absolutely. So it, this is like, there, there's what we call absolute contraindications than relative ones. So um, this first client, no, they cannot receive it at this time, but we can alter their blood pressure. And then um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, be able to, to give that medication. Um, I promise we won't give you anything too tricky where you're like, we have to assume blah, 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 blah. Um, just take the question as it's written. So a client has uh, had their appendix out four months ago. Hmm. So um, we do want to consider recent surgeries, but I think that they had to have surgery within the last like three months or so, I want to say is usually what they go by. Um, it's usually where they've had a much more recent procedure um, or invasive procedure that we would be concerned about. So I think that that client could receive TPA. So, so far, blood pressure of 210 over 115, nope. Um, appendix out four months ago, yes. INR of 1.5. So you're already going to start clicking and being like, ooh, INR, I think, I think is that elevator, is that low? Um, <clears throat> remember, INR is a sign of clotting. And so um, 1.5, because uh, I never even, I don't even know if I know the normal INR. I want to say this is a little bit above normal. Um, this is kind of like the first one um, where um, this is not an absolute contraindication. I probably need to rewrite this um, slide and make it more like what's an absolute contraindication. And here's the other thing I want to preface real quick is every hospital is different. There's like no set um, standards or um, anything like that. There's some general recommendations and I have those on my next slide um, that your book did update. Previously, your book had nothing about specific contraindications, um, but it's a little bit more specific now. But um as a whole, keep in mind, there's some things that are like, Ooh, like we need to be cautious with this. Like, for example, if their INR is a little elevated, um, yeah, I don't want them. They're already going to be like more likely to bleed. Um, so I'm definitely going to be concerned about that, but I can also reverse their INR. Like, let's say this INR was higher. I could also reverse their INR, give them some FFP, and then they could receive the TPA. So there are ways around it. Just like with the blood pressure, it is high, but I can treat that. Um, so a client with an INR of 1.5 could still receive that um, TPA. Um, they may require some treatments. The doctor will make that decision. The doctor at the end of the day makes the decision for this. Um, it's not the nurse who decides like, okay, they don't meet the, con they don't have any contraindications, but it is my job as the nurse to know what things might cue me to say, ding, ding, ding. Like I need to ask the doctor about this. A client has had a hemorrhagic stroke in the last year. That client cannot receive TPA. If someone has a history of a stroke, they cannot um, receive TPA, especially a hemorrhagic stroke. A client woke up with symptoms. So this is kind of what we talked about is that if a client woke up with symptoms uh, and do not create a story like, well, what if they were just sleeping for like an hour? Um, like what we're saying here is, is they slept and they like, oh, I, I hate like, cause I know we always tell y'all not to create a story, but um, like really it's just as it is. It's saying if a client woke up and when people wake up, they're usually waking up and maybe again, maybe I should rewrite this. A client woke up in the morning um, after, uh, well, like you see, now I just want to add all these details. And I told y'all, you guys, like, I know it seems like we're the ones that sit around like maniacally laughing and coming up with these scenarios, but it is really hard to write a scenario that students can't find a way to talk themselves out of. So anyway, the point is though, is, is that if a client woke up with symptoms, I do, they do not know their last normal. No one else knows their last normal. So they cannot receive TPA. Um, client with a GI bleed last month. Hmm, they had recent bleeding and they're about to get a medication that can cause them to bleed. What do you guys think? Eh, nope, they cannot. And how about client takes aspirin at home daily? That actually is okay. Um, so, you know, there is going to be sometimes that patients have taken things or have like antiplatelets on board. Most of these patients have cardiovascular disease. They can still get the TPA. Um, there is some stuff with like them being on anticoagulants and then getting TPA. I had a patient that was on a heparin drip and then they decided they wanted to give TPA and we had to wait a certain period of time or we had to reverse it or wait till it was out of his system. It was like a whole thing. Um, so anyway, um, but uh, antiplatelets are okay. So blood pressure of 210 over 115. Um, yes, they can after treatment, but at this time, no. So at, with a blood pressure of 210, they cannot yet receive the TPA. Appendix out four month, fine. INR of 1.5, it's okay. Hemorrhagic stroke in the last month, in the last year, sorry, nope. Client woke up with symptoms, nope. GI bleed last month, nope. Aspirin to at home daily, yep. Ah, come back here, you. Um, so 
like I mentioned, these vary based on the doctor and the facility. And I mean, if you Google like contraindications to TPA, you're going to find a variety of things. Like there is a lot out there. Um, it's up to the doctor to decide like whether it's absolute or relative and relative means like it's kind of not a good thing, but it may work sometimes. Um, but here's the ones that your book mentioned. So these are the ones that I would know. It says a recent history in the last three months of GI bleeding, stroke or head trauma. Um, uh, if they have, oh yeah, maybe I know I'm going back and thinking of my, uh, of my other, um, my one about the hemorrhagic stroke in the last year, I should probably update that to the last three months. Um, but I don't know if, um, if I'm not sure, let's see, it's like absolute contra contraindications less than three months. Oh yeah. So yeah, look, any prior intracranial hemorrhage. Yeah, I think if they've had any sort of, um, head bleed, they're never going to be able to get, um, to have TPA. Um, but anyway, uh, major surgery in the past two weeks um, or recent active internal bleeding, we don't want that. Um, but this is just one table that I found when I Googled just to give you some more reference. So some other things we may consider is, is having um, some sort of malformation or, you know, cancer in the brain. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. And like we talked about bleeding. Then some of the relative ones are like being on anticoagulants, pregnancy, um, CPR, um, you know, blah, 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 or major surgery. So yeah, so it just kind of depends. Like, so, but you can kind of get the point though, is we're really looking for, like, we're giving them a med that's going to cause them to bleed a lot. So we're looking for, do they have anything in their history or anything that could put them at risk for bleeding? Like if they have a new or fresh incision, they could bleed out from that. Um, so we definitely don't want that, but the brain, um, blood vessels and stuff like that are very sensitive. So we want, that's why we want to be careful. And that's why, like, if they've had a previous, um, head bleed, we don't ever want to give them TPA again. Um, not again, we don't ever want them to have TPA because it's very likely that they could bleed again. Um, but these are the things that you want to keep in mind. I know you're probably getting stressed after looking at that because it seems really wishy-washy, um, but just follow the general guidelines that I have here when it comes to uh, what the book says um, for these like last three months, the GI bleeding, stroke or head trauma, major surgery in the last two weeks or recent active internal bleeding. I promise we'll give you simple ones if we gave you any on the exam. All right. So um, we've talked about TPA, but there's another treatment that we can do for ischemic strokes. Um, and I need to add, I think I said, does it say ischemic stroke? Yeah, ischemic stroke. Um, so um, this is just for ischemic stroke. There's also what's called a stent retriever. And this is where we go in, like kind of like we go in with cath lab. It's not where we actually put a stent in. This is um, a device called a stent retriever. It looks like a stent. And what they do is they go in and they find the place in the brain where the clot is and they expand the stent. And then the clot that that's there, it actually seeps into the mesh of the stent. And what they do is they wait a short period of time and then they pull that out and it pulls the clot out with um, that stent retriever. So think it's like a retriever, like a golden retriever goes in and retrieves a ball. Stent retrievers go in and retrie uh, retrieve blood clots. This is also could be looked at as a thrombectomy. Now there's a variety of other procedures that they can go in and do. They can go in and spit some TPA more locally um, on the clots and stuff like that, um, and do other things to help um, with blockages. But this is just uh, one of the more common ones. Um, this allows for immediate blood flow and um, can lead to some really good uh, results if it's uh, if the patient qualifies. And I'm pretty sure what your book says is, is that um, with TPA, it has to be within four and a half hours with stent retrievers. And maybe I need to add this to the slide is that it has to be within, I believe, six hours of when their symptoms first started for the best chance um, or the best results. Um, but yeah, I think that's it for ischemic stroke therapy or treatments. Um, next, we'll get into hemorrhagic stroke. And I know ischemic stroke treatments are a little more complicated. TPA seems like a lot. Um, hopefully, I presented it in a semi-organized way that makes sense. Um, hemorrhagic stroke is a lot more simple. So uh, see you for that one.